a wealthy heiress, and one of the most colorful figures of the swinging 60s, Margaret married the Duke of Argyle, her second husband, in 1951. Twelve years later, the Duke sued for divorce, accusing Margaret of infidelity and producing evidence in the form of Polaroid photographs of her engaged in sexual acts to prove it. Dubbed the divorce of the century, the subsequent swirl of rumors, gossip, and scandal captivated the nation. Margaret was publicly humiliated as society first fed on and then utterly condemned her sexual relationships. But why was this divorce case particularly scandalous? And what were the infamous Polaroid photos that proved so contentious? Born on the 1st of December, 1912, Margaret Wyham was the only daughter of a Scottish millionaire, George Wyham, and his wife Helen Henry. Margaret spent most of her childhood in the vibrant city of New York. Once she finished her education there, she moved back to the UK, where her beauty and status as an heiress made her much in demand on the social scene. This led to a string of romantic relationships with some of the biggest names of her day. By the time she was 15, she became pregnant with David Niven's child while on a holiday on the Isle of Wight, but the pregnancy was terminated. 1930 was the year that marked her coming out as a debutante when upper-class girls and wealthy heiresses were presented at court and engaged in a season of social events that announced their arrival on the high society marriage market. Her coming out party, which cost £40,000, was held audaciously on the very first day of the social season, the 1st of May, 1930 at Audley Square. She went against convention by wearing a forget-me-not blue dress, instead of traditional white, claiming that she had ruined her original dress by accident. The dress was designed by couturier Norman Hartnell, cementing his reputation as the high society couturier, and hers as one of the best-dressed young women in the country. By the end of the season, she was declared debutante of the year, and such was her fame that she was referred to in the press as the Wyham. Margaret was presented to Queen Mary and the Prince of Wales at Buckingham Palace. Standing behind the Queen's throne was socialite, diplomat and son of the Aga Khan, Ali Khan. It appeared to be love at first sight. They were formally introduced the following day, and so started a great if short-lived love affair, ending when Margaret's father refused permission for them to marry because of Khan's Muslim faith. Margaret, still a teenager, was the fixture of the London social scene and was frequently to be found at the Embassy Club on Old Bond Street and the 400 Club in Leicester Square. Most evenings saw her first dining with one man, pleading tiredness and getting her chauffeur to drive her home, then going out to the Embassy Club with someone else and on to a further nightclub. Her close friends included George, Duke of Kent, with whom she was said to have had an affair, and Barbara Cartland, later step-grandmother to Princess Diana. Cartland became the fifth most translated novelist in the world, famed for her extravagantly sartorial style and liberal use of false eyelashes. She was later to say of Margaret, she was very beautiful and every man wanted to go to bed with her, and she wanted to go to bed with every man. She didn't have love affairs, which lasted a long time. I think men found her rather boring after a time. Margaret's love life read like a list of most eligible bachelors. She was simultaneously engaged to both the 7th Earl of Warwick and Max Aitken, son of newspaper tycoon, while having promised to marry the American financier and amateur golfer, Charles Sweeney, who she chose to marry in the end. Sweeney was a Roman Catholic, and in order to marry him, Margaret took instruction into the Catholic faith at the Jesuit Church of the Immaculate Conception in Farm Street. Their marriage on the 21st of February, 1933 took place at the Brompton Oratory in Knightsbridge. So many people wanted to get a glimpse of the glamorous bride in her Hartnell wedding dress with her handsome American husband that the traffic on the Brompton Road ground to a halt. 2,000 guests and the same number of gatecrashers crammed into the church. The event became known as the Great Wyham Scramble and was reported on in great detail in the press. Margaret Wyham was now Margaret Sweeney and such was her fame that Wodehouse, when anglicizing some of the lyrics of the Cole Porter song, You're the Top, wrote her into musical history with the line, You're Mussolini, You're Mrs. Sweeney, You're Camembert. In 1934, George Wyham bought the lease of Upper Grosvenor Street for Margaret and this was to remain her home until 1978. They became part of the world of American expats in London. After many miscarriages, Margaret had two children, Francis and Brian, 
and during World War II, they moved to the steel-enforced hotel for safety. Both Margaret and Charlie became involved in the war effort. Margaret joined the American Red Cross and scandalized the U.S. Army by insisting on wearing her signature three-strand pearls with their uniform. She took on the role of entertainment officer and drew in many prominent stars during that period. It was, however, her husband who made the biggest contribution. In 1943, Margaret had an accident that some say changed her personality. When visiting her chiropodist on Old Bond Street, she fell 40 feet down a lift shaft and was only just saved from being crushed by the lift. She had broken vertebrae, was given 30 stitches in her head without anesthetic, and was told that she might never walk again. They were actually wrong. By the end of the war, Margaret and Charlie's marriage was in trouble and they divorced in 1947. Margaret enjoyed life at Upper Grosvenor Street giving dinner parties, never cooked by her, she famously had never boiled a kettle or cooked a meal in her life. She spent time in the US and as ever, enjoyed a hearty love life. That year she met Douglas Campbell, heir to the Duke of Argyle, on a train back from Paris. He was still married to his second wife, but they were eventually to marry at Caxton Hall on the 22nd of March, 1951. It quickly became a toxic marriage that ended in 1963 with the most scandalous divorce case of the time. Central to the evidence that damned Margaret was the Polaroid photos, obviously taken with her consent, with an unnamed lover who became known in the press as the Headless Man. Douglas stole them from her upper Grosvenor Street home, then returned later with his daughter Jean, famously pinning Margaret to the bed as he told Jean to take the diary from her dressing table. Jean, who was briefly married to writer Norman Mailer, always regretted her involvement. The divorce brought such notoriety that nearly all of Margaret's friends abandoned her. She was estranged from her devoutly Catholic daughter for many years, and the money which had not been spent by Douglas disappeared in legal costs. Her adoring father George married his mistress, the trouser press heiress Jane Corby soon after his wife Helen died and Margaret became very isolated and notorious, forever the dirty duchess in the eyes of the public. Margaret was ever resourceful however. In the 1970s she offered tours of her house, which were given by her butler and included a glass of champagne for £7.50 per person. They did not however take off, and when the house had to be sold, she struck a deal to live in the Grosvenor House Hotel where she also entertained paying guests with a glass of Buck's Fizz for £15.95. She wrote a gossip column for the Tatler called Stepping Out with Margaret Argyle, but this proved to be a short-lived career, not helped by her inability to spell names correctly. Eventually, her bills were paid by her children Francis and Brian who also paid for her final home, the St. George's Nursing Home in Pimlico. Ever the Grande Dame, she refused to eat lunch at midday and waited until 1 p.m. when it was stone cold, reasoning that only the servants had lunch at 12. She still dressed up every day and declined a private suite, saying that she enjoyed people watching. She died on the 25th of July, 1993, and she is buried at Brookwood Cemetery near Charlie Sweeney, with whom she remained friends. Everyone said that Margaret was cold. She was spoilt and in many respects, not very likable. But like Oscar Wilde, 70 years before, she refused to quietly go away in the face of what she saw as an injustice and her husband's use of what we would now call revenge porn. In doing so she was damned by her private life becoming a cause celebre and not conforming to what society felt to be decent behavior. The wealthy area of Mayfair was made for the likes of Margaret. It was developed in the 17th century for London's wealthiest families where the greatest thing a woman could do was to be desirable and make a good match. Margaret may not have been entirely successful, but my word did she have fun trying.